Good morning, everyone. Greetings in the matchless name of Jesus. Let's say a word of prayer. Hallelujah, Lord. I thank you for this privilege to share your word. I just pray, Lord, that you will speak through me and that you will minister to everyone who hears, that there'll be a word that each one receives that will change their lives. I thank you. I just commit this time in your hands, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's a privilege and honor to stand before you today. Today I'm going to be talking about God's workmanship. Michelangelo was a famous um, artist in the Renaissance period, and one of his famous uh, sculptures is uh, the Statue of David, which even today people uh, go and visit in Florence. It was made in the 1500s, and it took two years for him to make. Uh, it seems that he, he had to, he hardly slept or even ate because he was so occupied with making this great work of art. And uh, uh, it, its proportions are so accurate. When you look at it, the, the veins and the hands and the contours of the muscles, it's almost uh, like a human being's. It's so clear, it's so near to uh, the real, uh, real uh, living being. So this is just such a beautiful masterpiece. Uh, in fact, uh, some of its critics said, no other artwork is equal to it in any respect with such just proportion beauty and excellence, did Michelangelo finish it. So that is a beautiful work of art. It's a masterpiece in our natural world. In the Bible, we read about a masterpiece. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this work, this word uh, workmanship is the word poema in Greek from which we get the English word uh, poem. So it's, it, it is uh, that which has been made a work of art. Uh, when I understood that the meaning of this word is uh, poem, I was delighted because my name, Kavita, means poem. So this verse is for me. Uh, I am his workmanship. I am God's poem. There's only one other instance in the Bible where this verse is mentioned, uh, and that is Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For ever since the creation of the world, his at invisible attributes his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through his workmanship, all his creation, the wonderful things that he has made, so that they who fail to believe and trust in him are without excuse and without defense. God has written two poetic masterpieces, one in physical creation and the other in the lives of men and women redeemed by his grace. And both are testimony to his eternal power and uh, of this great creator and redeemer of ours. To say that we are his workmanship gives us our identity. It denotes the person we are. Psalms uh, 139 verses 13 and 14 says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. The psalmist knows that he is uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. His soul knows it. It's so important that we know that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that our soul acknowledges that we are his workmanship. And if you look at uh, how artists make, uh, they, if it's a painter, they choose the best quality paper, uh, good paints and uh, brushes so that their work of art is perfect. Have you tried painting on a poor quality paper? Uh, the end result is really bad. So we really need good material for making some, a, a good piece of art. Even uh, Michelangelo, he, he built the statue of David from a single huge block of marble and it's almost 17 feet high so huge in proportions, but a perfect piece of marble. That's what, that was the, the uh, raw material of his creation. But what about God? How did he make his workman, 
uh, his piece of art. In Ephesians chapter 2, uh, it's written that we were dead in our transgressions. So we were, in a, we, were, we were not good at all. The material he made was that we were dead, we were sinful, and from that, he just poured out his mercy and grace on us. And he's made us that work, that beautiful work of art. For I used to, uh, when I first came to the Lord, I, I didn't know this truth that I am so valuable in God's eyes. I didn't know my identity. So it was uh, the way I prayed, the way I lived, uh, it was, I think, defeated. But when I came to understand who I am in Christ, it made a world of difference. I just started understanding that God was for me and that he loved me. And it just made a difference in the way I live. So it's so important. If there's anyone here who, has, who feels that they're not good enough, who feels that they are uh, inferior, I encourage you to believe in your heart that you are God's workmanship. And this workmanship, we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus. So we belong to him. He has redeemed us with his blood. The value of anything depends on the, on the price paid for it. Even a painting, only if it is, uh, some paintings are so much value because of the price that, they, that, they, that, it, uh, you know, that it costs. The same way, the, our value is so high because it, it was, uh, we, we cost the blood of Jesus. Uh, that is how valuable we are. In the book of Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 2, it states that the precious sons of Zion Valuable as fine gold, how they are regarded as clay pots, the work of the hands of the potter. Jeremiah writes this uh, at the time when uh, the people of Judah have been taken in exile to Babylon. And they must have feeling really low. They, they would not have understood their value. But that time he says, the precious sons of Zion, valuable as fine gold. Even though others don't value them, they are still gold. If you, you may be going through a difficult circumstance at this time, you may not have a job, you may be financially down, but I tell you, even that does not change your value. Your value is that of gold before your creator. Psalms 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastor. The Apostle Paul, uh, he was supposed to be taken to Rome and uh, he was uh, t to face Caesar and uh, he was taken by ship. So before going on the journey, he told the centurion, the captain, uh, saying that there's going to be a, the weather isn't good. We should uh, resist from going on this journey. But they didn't listen to him and they decided to go ahead with the journey. But afterwards, we see that there was a mighty storm in Acts 27 and the storm goes on for days to the point where they lost all hope of survival. And that particular, one particular night, an angel of the Lord appears to Paul and encourages him. And Paul goes on to say in Acts 27, verses 22 and 23, And now I urge you to, to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God, to whom I belong and whom I serve. In spite of the very difficult situations that he had gone through in the, the storm and the many times that, uh, that Paul had been persecuted, he knew whom he belonged to and whom he served. Uh, just uh, last week, on Wednesday morning, uh, I was sitting for prayer uh, at, at home. And uh, at that time, suddenly there was a, there was a mighty wind around in our area with a little bit of rain. And uh, there were sounds outside, but I, I, I didn't uh, make much of it. Then after some time, we just went upstairs to check what had happened, if anything happened in our home, when any windows had, uh, you know, shut and all that all got open. So when I looked, I saw that there's a bal that we have a balcony in the back of the second floor, and it's covered with uh, roof tiles, clay roof tiles. And... Uh, the whole, that whole uh, set of tiles, around 50 to 60 of them, fell down and they were lying on the roadside, shattered. So it just took five minutes for that whole thing to come down. And I was just thinking, my God, it doesn't take much to lose everything. Um, and then after some time, we just went out. And I was thinking, oh, it's going to cost a lot to replace it. Because the wind had just come underneath and lifted the whole thing up. But fortunately, nothing happened to anyone else. There was no damage to anyone else's property. 
and then a lady came uh, by she was a simple lady and she was she came hearing the sound and she looked and she said oh she was feeling so bad oh look at the destruction i'm so, so sorry about it and then she said these are the end times jesus is coming soon um and i agreed with her i don't know i've not met her before and then she said uh, difficult times happen for believers too and i was thinking the wisdom that she spoke with and i agreed with her and she it seems had lost her sister uh, just uh, recently due to covid but in that time she knew who she belonged to and i was just thinking it doesn't take much education for a person to know who they belong to it just has it's just that matter of faith are we like that if a simple probably and not too educated woman could think so how much more should we who have the word of god and are reading it be able to believe that we belong to this god so we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and what is the purpose for good works that uh, word good is agathos it describes what originates from god and is empowered by him usually when we think about good works we think it is uh, probably given to the poor charity but it it does mean that but not only that let's look at the word of god as to what good works is if you look in matthew chapter 26 jesus is visiting uh, the house of simon the leper at bethany and uh, a woman comes to him and with an alabaster jar and she takes the perfume and pours it on his head and anoints him seeing this disciples are uh, they they say this is such a waste of money it should have been given to the poor and let's see jesus's response in matthew chapter 26 verses 10 to 13 But when Jesus was aware of it he said to them why do you trouble the woman for she has done a good work for me for you have the poor with you always but me you do not have always for in pouring this fragrant oil on my body she did it for my burial assuredly i say to you wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her so she had done a good work for jesus our first act of goodness should be should come out it should be a radical act of love to the lord i think every good work should originate from our love and devotion to the lord uh, this woman even though the name is not mentioned here is mary the sister of martha and lazarus and we see in many instances how mary always chose to give her devotion to the lord and because of that she did the right thing and jesus even though she would not have understood how significant that anointing was but she was able to align herself out of that love to do the will of god david was a man of god even as a shepherd or a king he he always put his devotion to the lord first that's why god called him a man after his own heart so the first good work should come out of our love for the lord even in revelation chapter 2 Jesus speaks to uh, the church in Ephesus and he is uh, 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 acknowledging their good works their work of labor and patience and the fact that they kept away from evil and he also says that you have been able to discern between true and false apostles but there's one thing i have against you and revelation 2 verses 4 and 5 says nevertheless i have this against you that you have left your first love remember therefore from where you have fallen repent and do the first works or else i will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent so she is telling them repent and go to your first works those works that originated which which uh, the 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 origin of that was the, your love for me go back to those work works if not you will be removed just imagine such a stern warning jesus gives to them so the first thing is to have, our work should originate from our love for the lord and secondly let's see some other good works in john chapter 10 uh, G- uh, jesus is in the temple and the jews come to him and say are you the christ and jesus replies you know i've already said uh, said this and my works a testimony of the other fact of that and he says me and my father are one and then the jews are angry with him and they say in john chapter 10 verses 31 and 32 then the jews took up stones again to stone him jesus answered them 
Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? So Jesus says, the, for many works, good works uh, that I've shown you, you're, are you stoning me for that? What are these good works that Jesus is mentioning? These are the miracles for Jesus. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, uh, he raised the dead. Those were the works he was talking about. And later on in John 14, Jesus tells the disciples, you will also do greater works. John 14 verse 12 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. I, I believe in this time of our church, of the ecclesia, that God wants us to walk in those miracles. Not just the pastors, not just people in crusades, but every disciple should walk in those miracles, being able to lay hands on the sick and heal them. In our family, uh, many, in many situations, I think this is one truth that the Lord taught, taught us when we were young believers, that we, we, had, we could walk in divine health. So we pray for each other. And I remember once uh, when my daughter was going to school, and usually small kids have this, just before uh, going to school, they say, I've got a tummy ache or whatever. And I won't, I will just say, I'll just say, let's pray. I'll pray, and then in the end she'll say, Amma, just when you were praying, I got healed. So their faith increased. We need to walk in those miracles um, even now. The next, in our homes. In Acts chapter 9, we read the story about, uh, about Tabitha, otherwise known, known as Dorcas. Uh, she was a woman who died, and God used Peter to bring her to life. And uh, she is called a disciple who was full of good works and acts of charity. And when Peter came there, the other women were crying and they were say, showing the clothes, the things that uh, Doc, the Dorcas had made. And, she, and they said she had done so many good things. So she was a woman, even from her home, who probably made things and gave it to the poor with what she had. So even you mothers at home, you women at home, I encourage you, even now, you can look and see what can you do for your neighbors? How can you help them? Those are good works. And those are works that God honors. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, we read how uh, Paul advises how widows should be chosen to be covered by the church. What were their requirements? 1 uh, Timothy 5 verses 9 to 10 says, A widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation of good works. And if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work. So the good works he's talking about is, one, to bring up the children. Secondly, to be hospitable to strangers and to wash their feet. And third, finally, to assist those who are in distress. So I believe that each one of us are called in our homes to, uh, to, to, do, to do these good works. Especially at home, I think at this time, all of us are at home with our children. And these are the times that parents should know, they should see your life, that your life is one of good works. Our preaching doesn't count so much. They know. They know how we behave. When a situation comes, are you getting angry? Are you getting irritated when you have so much work in the home? Or are you living and showing them your good works? That really matters. And then in the marketplace. Titus was a young pastor appointed to bring order in Crete, to appoint elders and oversee the work of the church. And uh, Paul advises him how to deal with different people of different age groups, how to choose elders. And he also talks about, tells him to be an example of good works to everyone. In Titus 2 verses 7 and 8, it says, In all things, show yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, corru incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. So he advised uh, uh, he, to, for him to be an example in integrity, dignity, and sound teaching. It's so important in our workplaces that we be an example of good works. Uh, I worked as an eye specialist for uh, 15 years in a hospital, and I took a lot of decisions 
depending on what the word of god or what the how the lord was guiding guiding me and uh, sometimes other people couldn't understand that so in the beginning when my children were younger i worked part time part time and so uh, the person in charge of our hospital you say uh, you're going to lose your seniority uh, don't you think you'll regret later and your salary will be so low but then i just knew at that time that is the thing that i needed to do i needed to be in connect with my work but at the same time my first responsibility is to bring up my children the ways of the lord and uh, later on many years later uh, when i was leaving the hospital my children had grown up gone for a good education uh, one doctor came to me and said i've seen you these years and i've seen the decisions that you have taken and your decisions have proven good look at the way your children have grown up and i was thinking lord to hear that that is such a such a, a strength for me to i'm great we really need to choose those good works in the marketplace even little things they people look at us uh, whether we are uh, going to be uh, people of integrity whether if, even if it's a small thing whether you you would take it or you know uh, just be uh, sure no no this is this belongs to the office i cannot use it i cannot misuse it to have that type of of character that is what the lord is calling for us in the marketplace so these are the different places where we have our good works so as i said first your devotion to the lord is your greatest good work after that working in in miracles thirdly in the home and lastly in the marketplace so in every area we can we can operate in these good works so god has called us he has made us his workmanship created in christ jesus for good works what is what is his plan according to his plan if you look at that key verse in ephesians 2 verse 10 which god prefer, prepared for us beforehand taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us so god has made a path for us i believe god has a dream for each one of us uh and don't limit god's dream it's way beyond our imagination so i was saying no that i i had worked so many years as a doctor i would never have thought as a doctor that i would change that profession but 15 years down the lane the lord said now that's the next phase go to the next uh type you you have to come into ministry so i was thinking what i don't know anything lord all i know is to look after patients to examine them or to do surgeries but i don't know anything beyond that the lord said that's enough you just come out and i'm just so grateful to the lord it's been almost 5 years since i've come into ministry and the lord has just developed some other skills i never imagined were in me see the lord made you and he knows better than you what is inside you and if we let him take that plan and use it his dream is so much better than ours truly uh, jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 says before i formed you in the womb i knew you before you were born i sanctified you i ordained you a prophet to the nations so that word i think everyone knows that but just imagine the call on jeremiah's life a prophet to the nations and at that time it is a terrible call because no one listened to him no one uh, you know every, there were so many kings he kept on telling them uh, judah is going to be captured why don't you this is going to happen but they didn't agree and they uh, punished him they imprisoned him what a life but even till the end even now we read about jeremiah his name goes down in history as a mighty prophet of the lord so it doesn't depend on the circumstances what we need to know is to check on is whether we are in his perfect plan i'm going to look at the life of two kings in the bible and the way they chose which path they took uh In 1 Kings chapter uh, 12 and 13 we read the life of Jeroboam. So actually after Solomon during the time of David and Solomon the kingdom it was a single kingdom Israel was a single single kingdom but at the time of Solomon's son Rehoboam the kingdom was divided into two. But Judah came under Rehoboam and uh, Israel came under Jeroboam. And uh, Jeroboam uh, he decided that he would make Uh, places of worship all over israel so that the people would not go to the temple and he didn't because he didn't want to lose his kingdom so he built uh, golden calves on the the hills of bethel and dan and he started worshiping uh, encouraging people to worship there and this was uh, evil really evil in the eyes of the lord 
one day when he was standing at the altar at Bethel, uh, God sent a prophet from Judah and uh, he came with a word. So we read in 1 Kings chapter 13 verse 2, Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. And as a sign of this, the altar will split in two. And that just happened at that moment. But this happened probably in 920. But 300 years later, uh, Josiah became king at the age of eight. He was the grandson of Manasseh, King Manasseh and the son of Ammon, two evil kings. But he decided to do what was right in the Lord's eyes. At the age of 26, 18 years down his um, rule, uh, he, uh, he decided to clean up the temple, restore the temple, and uh, they found the book of law. And he asked the, it to be read. And when it was read, he, he understood that Judah had, uh, had really sinned against God, and he just repented before the Lord for his people. And he made a covenant with the Lord and decided that he would put an end to all that was evil before the Lord. And with that, he went and cleansed the temple. He, cleansed the, he removed the high places. And he goes to Bethel, and he, removed, he breaks down the altar. And just around that, there are tombs. And he takes the bones from those tombs and places it on the altar and burns them, just as the prophet had spoken 300 years back. And he continued till his, till his last day. He, he lived the life according to the Lord, fulfilling his purposes. And we read in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 25. Now before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. There was no one like him. He made it a point to fulfill every plan that God had for him. But when you look at another king, King Saul, Saul was the first king of Israel, and uh, the people had wanted a king, and so finally God said, okay, give them a king. And, uh, but God chose Saul as the king. But Saul was disobedient from the beginning, and he did things his own way, to the point that God decided to take the kingdom away from him. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, it says, And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So the Lord had had a plan to establish Saul's kingdom forever. But because of his disobedience, he lost it and he went away from that plan. So uh, we have a choice to walk in God's plans or just to divert and just step out of that plan. That choice is ours. He always, even though that plan is there, that beautiful dream is there, it is up to us to choose whether to walk in that or to step out. It's like using Google Maps. You can choose to go the, into the path that they decide. But sometimes, you know, when we, when we go wrong, there's a rerouting. And you're lucky if you have a rerouting, you can come back to the course. But many times you just go off course completely. And then they say, no, no, you have to turn back, turn back. So the same way, you know, God keeps on telling us, come back to the path, come to this path. If you're walking in his path, you can fulfill his dreams completely. Uh, I remember in an interview uh, that I'd seen of uh, uh, the famous evangelist, uh, Reinhard Bonnke, uh, who, was, who did a mighty work in Africa, and how the Lord in 1972 uh, gave him a vision of a blood-washed Africa. And... Uh, he was fearful to hear that because he had already started working in Africa and there were hardly any results. So, uh, and he was under another mission organization and he knew that that organization would probably not promote such a work. So he was uh, confused and he said, Lord, uh, what should I do? Let me stay in this organization and just do what I can. And suddenly the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, if you do not follow this plan, I will choose someone else. And 
Renard Monke shook out of fear. He got up, went to his home, re resigned immediately, and the rest is history because he is one man that God used throughout Africa to conduct so many healing crusades. And I'm just thinking, if it was not him, God may have used someone else. But Renard would have lost the chance of serving such a mighty God in a mighty way. So we look, we see that we have to walk in his paths. So how do we walk in his paths? First of all, we need to walk with God, just walking with him every step of the way. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Sometimes, you know, we think that God won't show us the way. Many people at different ages, they think, what's next? Will God show it? If we go to him, if we ask him, he will direct our paths. Some way or the other, he will close unnecessary doors and he will open the right doors. So in everything you do, acknowledge him and walk with him. That's the first thing that we need to do when we walk in his paths. Secondly, surrender your will to the Lord. I've seen many, many of us at many times, uh, we pray one thing and we say, okay, Lord, I want admission in this college, okay, and then we start praying for it. We don't even know whether that is God's will. That is not a surrendered life, but we should pray, Lord, show us, open the right door. I probably sense that this is the way, but Lord, if it isn't, do it this way. Surrender. Surrender is so important in fulfilling that plan of the Lord. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the second way that we walk in his paths is by surrendering our lives totally. And we're living sacrifices. We can get up any time, but we have to make a decision. No, I'm not going to get up. I'm going to stay on the altar and I'm going to do whatever the Lord tells me. Thirdly, obey what you already know to be God's will. 95% of what we need to know is in the Bible. The Word of God has instructions, clear instructions, do this, follow this. And it's just a small percentage where the Lord says, this way, that way. But the basic thing comes, 95% comes from the Word of God. So just being in the Word of God, reading the Word, and that will give you clarity as to how to go, what is right, what is wrong. So you need to be in the Word of God and obey what you've already heard. Fourthly, seek godly input. In this time, I know it's difficult for us because we don't meet together on Sundays, but stay in fellowship. Stay uh, connected to your care cell. Tell others what is happening in your life, and they will speak into your life. You always need to have two or three godly, you know, people who are walking in godliness to speak to you and say that, oh, this was good, or this was not uh, so good. It helps us to keep right on track. Many times, I'm so, I'm so grateful that uh, my husband is one person who really, you know, corrects me many times when I just go a little off track, or my, or my friends, uh, they're so accurate, and then I just think, oh Lord, thank you for them, thank you for them. When you hear it, it's not very encouraging when they correct us, but then it is such a safeguard for us to have people who are godly, uh, to keep, to stay in that path. And finally, listen to God's Holy Spirit. It's not the last or least, it is so important. Listen to that voice of the Holy Spirit. I mean, when I came into ministry, it was that voice that brought me out from my job, that clear voice that said, it's time, go, I've got other things for you. But I confirmed that voice with, other, with some other godly counsel and also with, an, with other confirmations. But that voice is so precious. Learn to hear that voice. And I used to feel when I was younger that God doesn't speak to me, God doesn't tell me. But as I desire more and more to know his will, he just, it may not be a word also, it's just a sense knowing that this is the right way go in this path, do this. So listening to the Holy Spirit is so key. So it's, uh, I, those four or five points are that how do we walk in his paths? Walk with God, surrender your will to God, obey what you already know to be God's will, seek godly input, pay attention to how God has wired you and listen to his Holy Spirit. 
And I believe that God has called each one of us to fulfill his dream. Going back to my key verse, Ephesians 2, 10 saying, for we are his workmanship, not yours, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. For what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And I pray that today everyone who is listening to this message will be encouraged that you will understand that you are God's workmanship, that you belong to him, that you have been created for good works, and that you are led to fulfill every plan, every dream he has. Let's close with a prayer. Hallelujah, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for this time. I know this word is from you, Lord. And your name be glorified, Father, Lord. I pray, Lord, that everyone listening now will understand truly who they are, the person they are. They will understand whom they belong to, that they belong to you totally, Father, Lord. Abba, Father, Lord, prepare them for the good works, whether it's devotion to you, whether it's miracles, whether it's to be someone great in the marketplace, someone special at home, whatever it is, guide them, guide them, Lord, and help us, Lord, to fulfill your dreams for us, that we may walk in your paths, and even if anyone is off track at this time, Lord, bring them back, Lord, at this time, Lord, bring them back to your path, Lord, I know that you are waiting for them to come back, and I come at this time in your hands, Lord, and I thank you for this word, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you.